And those of us in the beautiful hill country have been talking to the rain angels and we're having some quiet conversations with them and we're inviting them in. So some people think the aliens will come before the rain angels come, but we, <laughs> we'll see. Right? But it's, it's beautiful, but boy, it's been dry here. And, um, and it's not global warming, it's probably something else. Good morning, this is Patrick Timpone, OneRadioNetwork.com. It is the 7th of June, we're going to have fun this morning. Martin Armstrong is in the green room, we love talking to him, he's been at this for a long time. Man, and uh, we're going to talk to him about how he first got into this, he just told me a great story and uh, uh, with my mentor Andrew Goss and the real world of money who left us a few years ago, who is a gold and silver guy, I really understand the idea of uh, silver and gold, and I can remember when I was, um, well, I'm going to put Armstrong on when I tell him the, this quick story, but in about two hours, we're going to talk with uh, a regenerative farmer and his wife and his uh, baby. They're in uh, Austin, and they do regenerative farming for pigs. If you can, Yeah, man, it's the best stuff ever, and uh, so we're going to have them on the air, and uh, she, I saw her before and after, during and after her pregnancy, and about a week after her pregnancy, she looked like a supermodel. So we're going to tell you girls how she managed to do that. Martin Armstrong is here, Armstrong Economics. I'm one of his, uh, I got a little private thing that I pay uh, not too much, a few bucks a month, and I get some of his secret stuff, and you can do that too, and he'll tell you how to do it. He has this AI thing called Socrates, which uh, I predicted, um, I think it, uh, well, forget it, uh, Martin Armstrong, good morning. Just good morning. This, just this other day we were talking about on, on uh, I actually was writing about it on Facebook. When I was in, in, um, in high school and I had a 52 Chevy and you had a silver quarter, right? And you could buy yeah. a gallon of gas for a silver quarter. Gas was like 25 cents, right? Lucky strikes were 20 cents. I remember that. Cause, and, and today... Today, that same silver quarter, guess what? You can buy a gallon of gas even at six dollars. What about what's that about? What's that about? Well, it's basically the the whole issue of what really is inflation. Mm -hmm. Is it that the silver quarter is going up in value or is it the purchasing power of the dollar that's going down? Hmm. Uh, they like to call it inflation, but it's actually the opposite. You know, you always blame the other side. That's, that's pretty much <laughs> what they do. Uh, what do you mean? So deflation of the dollar is what it is. Pre- yeah. Pretty much. Yeah. It, yeah. It's, you know, by saying it's inflation, I mean, even <clears throat> they say that's the job of the Fed. Well, the Fed <clears throat> can only control money supply that's printed and with the vast majority of the money supply is what the, the they issue in bonds um and back you talk about the 60s back at back yeah. then yeah if you had an e-bond and you went to the bank and you said gee i want to borrow against it it was illegal oh, really so after 1971 hmm. that changed oh when nixon so took the, the problem, dollar off the gold standard when he took the dollar off the gold standard. yeah i mean <clears throat> So the old theory that the central bank is in charge of inflation never changed. You know, that was maybe true when you couldn't borrow against the bonds. But if you want to trade futures or something like that, what do you do now? You put in T-bills as collateral. You can, you can borrow against them. No problem. So there's, you know, the only difference between what the Fed does, it may print money, fine, but it doesn't pay interest. What the government does, it just spends money, <laughs> issues bonds, so it creates money that pays interest. That's it. That's it. Uh, how much of what has been being borrowed by uh, the Team Biden these days with everything going on is purchased by the, uh, by the Federal Reserve Bank of New York and by creating dollars and the street? Do we know that bid to cover? Is that about 50% of them or? Well, no, I mean, it's no. what's happening right now is because of the crazy war in Ukraine. Uh, you have a lot of people putting their money in the United States. So um, that's the same thing that happened World War I, World War II. Um, hmm. Actually, you know, if you look at it uh, historically, the U.S. Was, was bankrupt in 1896. 
you know, that's when J.P. Morgan had to lend $100 million in gold to bail out the Treasury. You had <laughs> um, William Jennings Bryan running for president saying, thou shalt not crucify man upon a cross of gold. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all that sort of stuff back then. And uh, so we go from bankrupt in 1896 to the leading world economy after World War I. Uh, Britain lost its, its crown at that point. And then after World War II, we ended up with 76% of the entire world gold reserves. How do we do that? How do we do that? Because everybody was running around blowing themselves up. <laughs> <laughs> so the money all came here. Um, the that's why won. the dollar became the reserve currency. Hmm. Hmm. Um, it wasn't that you know they liked the way we smiled or something like that. It was just that. Look, if you got tanks running around your streets blowing up the banks, you're going to leave your money there. Uh, they got it out. So, um, with all the stuff going on in the EU and the oil and the gas in Ukraine, a lot of the money boys are coming here, Martin Armstrong, and pretty, buying. Yeah, what what mean, are they buying? Just anything they get their hands on? They've been buying equities, real estate, mm -hmm. um, also you know you know U.S. Treasuries. Uh, you also have to look at this is kind of like dumb and dumber honestly uh <laughs> they lowered interest rates in europe to negative in 2014. yes sir. they still haven't gotten them up now <clears throat> these politicians they have zero experience honestly you might as well you know ask the taxi cab driver gee are you free today i need brain surgery you know <laughs> um <laughs> they simultaneously had passed a law that everybody should be protected in their pensions and everything else so they directed pension funds that should be depending on what country anywhere between 70 percent to 100 percent has to be in government bonds because that's safe like social security is 100 percent government bonds so now you take the the interest rates to negative they need eight percent to break even so oh, they have wiped the, out all yeah. the pension funds in Europe. Because of inflation, they just need it. Wow, yeah. So all that money has been coming here because Europe is a complete mess. Um, I seriously doubt that it's going to be able to uh, withstand maybe another two or three years. Um, I mean, but you're already seeing the spreads and in interest rates start to widen Germany. Um, is still the best, but you know you have rates going up on Italy and, and Greece already again. Uh, so it, it's just a mess. It's just when you a say widen, uh, when you say widen, Mr. Armstrong, uh, explain to us what you mean by that. So the interest rates are going up compared to what they were. Germany, for example. Yeah, Germany, uh, right. So they, in other words, you know, when they were forming the euro, they actually came to to my conference in London. Hmm. And I explained to them, I said, look, you know, this is not going to work this way. <laughs> and they were uh, only interested in how could they sell it. All right. So they were to comparing the it to the U.S. dollar. I see. And then saying, "Every we join the euro and everybody will pay, you know, the low interest rate. And I said, look, this is not going to happen unless you consolidate all the debts. Now you're the same as the United States. You're only talking about federal. But they had sold that pitch, and it was ridiculous. And because we have a single currency here, but we have 50 states. Yes. And they all pay different interest rates based upon their credit worthiness. Um, the worst is Massachusetts, and the best is, is Tennessee. Hmm. Uh, but that's what's happening in Europe. So the worst are Italy and Greece, and so their interest rates are going up at a premium above everybody else. And now all of a sudden you have people saying, oh, the ECB, they should lower their rates and buy more of their debt to, to, to even it out. This is not going to work. It's just, going, it's just it, this is the final stages of uh, what I call a sovereign debt crisis. And it's mainly because it's just all propaganda over there it's just made up so it, it, so so do you think that more people 
are going to bail, uh, like Italy and, and Greece and other people, and break up the EU? And can investors like Patrick and my worldwide audience, can we make money off of knowing this or thinking this? Or yeah, I mean, that's what, what's happening. I mean, the Europe, <clears throat> Europe will break up. Oh. Um, I mean, you can look on my site. The real reason they didn't structure it properly was because the German chancellor at the time was Kohl. Oh, and, yeah. and Kohl, he has even admitted that had he put the joining the euro to a vote to, for the German people, they would have voted against it. Hmm. So he just did it by decree. He did. Like, like Biden does. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Some kind and, of order or something, executive order or something. Yeah, he just, yeah. and that's all he did. And so then he said, no, we can't consolidate the debts because he was already doing it as a dictator to begin with. <laughs> and, the, and the Germans would have rose up and, and probably, you know, stormed his palace at that point. Hmm. Um, <clears throat> so <clears throat> that's why they never consolidated the debt. It was never like this theory of we're going to be like the United States and the, and the euro is going to beat the dollar. That was all fiction, complete uh, nonsense. So as long as they all stay separate with their own debt, Italy and, and everybody, um, at some point it's just going to fall apart because they're not one team, one package. Exactly. One package. It, wow, yeah. <laughs> like the Federal Reserve doesn't care if interest rates are at 8% in one state and 4% in another. It's their own. Yeah. That's on yeah. them. One week, one in, week. in Europe, that's not the case. They all expect to be able to pay the same, mm -hmm. even though one spends, you know, three times more than the other one. It's 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 just I mean, a four year old would figure this out. It's not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> Martin Armstrong is with us. If you'd like to ask him a question, triple eight six six three sixty three eighty six. We're live here. Seven June twenty twenty two. Or my email is Patrick at one radio network dot com. Patrick at oneradionetwork.com. So, um, oil. Wow, this is fun. So J.P. Morgan, Goldman Sachs are all saying, you know, that 125 oil we were predicting, I think it's going to be 140. So do they say this, Martin Armstrong, just because they're betting that oil is going to go up and they're going to make money when everybody else believes them? No, not really. No. Oh, Our good. computer okay. showing it's going to go to about 250. <laughs> oh, come on. What? Hello. Really? Next year, we could be looking at, at 230 to 250 even. Wow. Um, How about this summer? What does Socrates say about this summer? Like, you know, anything? It's just, Well, I haven't looked at it that short term, but uh, the problem, again, you have just people doing things uh, politically. I mean, in, in all honesty, if you look at Ukraine. It's it's a, it's just mostly propaganda. Yes, sir. Um, I like mean, that. here you oh we're under attack. Look, the first thing if you if Putin really was going to try and conquer Ukraine, what he would do the same thing we did to Iraq. The first thing you do is you go in, you take out the power grid, then you take out the communications, and you take out the water supply. And the central He's bank, right? And the central bank, they took that, didn't they? J. Yeah, P. Morgan? I mean, yeah. you <clears throat> look. Biden's wife went to Kiev. All these leaders are going to Kiev. That shows it's not a war side, you know, zone. It, it, it's just, you know, come on. She's bringing flowers over to his wife. He's in the Donbass, where the Russian population always was, mm -hmm. and it, it's just really kind of nuts. Um, well, Mr. Armstrong, I'd like to uh, understand. So, the, the word that we got, and tell me if this is correct, that Putin um, wanted to make sure that NATO get into a Ukraine, and he wanted to get a deal for a long time, and the NATO and the United States and globalists didn't want that. Is that close? Well, not really. Okay. What happened was, most people don't realize, but Ukraine was the third largest nuclear power in the world. They had really? more nukes than China. Really? And huh. so when the Soviet Union broke up, yeah. that was the Belgrade Agreement, that they would return all their nukes to Russia. NATO agreed not to invade, mm -hmm. and Russia agreed not to invade as long as they remain neutral. 
What year was this? That was uh, not after. Uh, it was uh, basically right after 1991. Okay. All right. When Russia collapsed. Okay. <clears throat> then, when you had the um, Maidan revolution, then there was uh, the Minsk Agreement. All right. The Minsk Agreement said that they would allow the Donbass and those regions to vote on their independence because the country was breaking up. Mm hmm. And that was brokered by, you know, uh, France and Germany. And Zelensky's refused to comply with that. Now, you can Google um, the, you know, they want to, uh, most of the, the things that they put out about, about Putin are really a lot of it's propaganda. Um, there are two things that probably prompted him to go in. One, we, there was a, a Munich security conference and on February 20th, they sent over Harris instead of the Secretary of, of State. I mean, I mean, you know, she doesn't know what she's doing on anything. Sure. And she was there and said, you know, oh, gee, you know, um, Ukraine should join NATO, which was a complete violation of the Belgrade Agreement. But then Zelensky stood up, and you can Google this too, if they haven't taken it off the web yet. Uh, Daily Mail in Britain covered it. He, on February 23rd, he stood up and said that we're going to uh, reestablish nuclear weapons uh, in Ukraine to, against Russia. Putin went in the next day. Um, and, you know, they want to pretend that, oh, he, he was trying to, invade Ukraine. Like I said, he clearly didn't do that. Um, otherwise, you would have, you know, taken out the power grid, the water supply and the communications. But he didn't do any of that. He basically stayed with the Donbass region, which is what he originally said he was doing. So it's been about um, not having nukes close to him to someday blow him up. Kind of. People don't realize it. I mean, you can look at the threats that come from the second tier. All right. Already, I think it was just today, one of them said, if you give uh, Ukraine long range missiles and they start sending them into Russia, we will take out the decision making uh, places to do this. Yeah. Which is basically Washington, D.C., Brussels. <laughs> Good. Um, and the second tier. You have to, you know, Putin put out a, did his own memoirs, etc. I mean, if you understand, you have to, like the art of war, you better understand your enemy. Um, Putin is really nostalgic and a historian. Kiev was the original place where the Russians began. Huh. So that's why he said, oh, they're really our brothers. Okay. Okay. Um, He's more nostalgic in that way and wouldn't want to nuke um, <clears throat> Kiev. The second tier, they don't care. To them, this is war, and they know it's really between the United States and, and, and Russia, and if they would take out Kiev in a heartbeat. The second tier being? You know, the, the guys who would basically around him and, and replace him if, he, if you uh -huh. overthrow him. Wow. Um, so, I mean... Putin is not um, Stalin. You know, he's just not. You know, and if he was, we'd be in a lot more trouble than we are. But, um, you know, just be careful what you wish for. Yeah. I mean, there yeah. are people that are just as ruthless behind him than we have also our neocons, you know, like Lindsey Graham, oh, somebody should assassinate him and, sure. you know, stuff like this. I mean, uh, can you imagine if a Russian said that Putin should be, you know, should have somebody assassinate Biden? I mean, it would be oh like, God. what are you oh talking my, about? Yeah, I mean, so, so the globalist and the NATO boys controlling Biden, what do they want out of this deal? Do they, what do they want to someday go in and take Putin out, do you think? Look, there are declassified documents from the Clinton administration hmm. that show that, um, uh, mainly was Barisnovsky, and the deal uh, that they were trying to get was the U.S. to support them 
they would take out Yeltsin and they wanted to join uh, NATO. Wow. Why? The sales pitch was after World War II, you absorbed your two enemies, Japan and Germany. We, you know, put us in charge. We're businessmen and we want the same deal. Now, if you did that, uh, what's the purpose of NATO? Do you need NATO anymore? Uh, if you're not there guarding the borders against, you know, evil Russia. So, you know, I would say the people in, in, in a lot of these areas don't want world peace. If there was really world peace, then they're out of a job. Yeah. Yeah, I think that you, it's fair to say they're doing everything they can to make us more miserable. Like monkey yes, pox or monkey pox or you know oil prices, gas prices. I mean, you name it. Right, this food supply thing blowing up egg factories, chicken factories, chicken. I mean, they're crazy. Even people. Henry Kissinger came out and I said know. they should give up the land to Russia. Well, I mean, we're in trouble when Kissinger start making sense, right? <laughs> well, I mean, the point is, is that the Russian. <laughs> Uh, empire before the Soviet Union uh, was right up to the river, so that's why everybody east of you know of uh, Kiev is mostly Russian. They hmm. speak Russian. Hmm. Uh, Crimea, they're Russians. They're, they've never been Ukrainians. All right, Ukraine means borderland. It wasn't even its own country until the Soviet Union. Oh. All right, so. Um, it was part of Poland and, and back and forth. It was always, you know, a football back and forth in that area. But um, so it, you have to understand that, okay, so fine. If you want Russia out, then what are you going to do? You're going to just go in there and kill all the Russians that are left? Um, you know, it, it's Kissinger saying they should surrender that land to Russia. They're Russians. They want to be Russia. You know, they don't want to be Ukrainian. And the, I think human rights, they have a right to do so. You know, but you have Zelensky saying we will not yield one inch. So what is this, the 19th century empire building where we're fighting over territory? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Not people? Mm -hmm. yeah. it, it's, it would be very simple just to end all this and say, yeah, okay, fine. The Minsk Agreement said Donbass was supposed what? to vote. Let them vote. But they, 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 as you say, Martin Armstrong, they don't want that. They want no. to make our life miserable because because <laughs> they just don't like us or they want to control us more. Is that the deal? They, I don't know. I don't think that some of these people can possibly sleep at night without an enemy to hate. Hmm, really? It, it just has to be somebody that they're against. Wow. Um, That's spooky. It is. I mean, you can also see on, on YouTube uh, McNamara kind of apologize. He was the neocon that, you know, really started the, uh, and advocated for the Vietnam War. <clears throat> Before he died, there's a video on there of him apologizing, said, well, you know, we kind of got it all wrong. I've seen that. Uh, yeah. It was really a civil war and we mm. overestimated uh, the interest mm. of Russia, you know. Yeah. You know, that's nice, but 50,000 guys died because of that. Yeah, yeah. We got that one wrong. Yeah, I mean, they get them always wrong. I mean, weapons of mass destruction. Um, That's right. That's right. Have or, they gotten any of them right yet? <laughs> do you realize, too, that they, well, you know, that they went in and they killed uh, Gaddafi, too. He, he wasn't, he was a dictator, but he was a pretty good guy, you know? I mean, come on. Well, the, the problem was, even wow. you know, Saddam Hussein, I mean, yeah. <clears throat> Um, I, I know Bill Crystal, who even wrote the book to justify going in Iraq. He was he's a real neocon. But um, the theory was that if they put democracy in these places, then Israel will be safe. These people never had democracy. <laughs> you took out Saddam Hussein and then, yes, Saddam Hussein was kind of ruthless. All right, fine. But he kept the religious you know, zealots in check. Sure, he kept them. Once you took him out, then you had ISIS come in. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, you have to look at these things from a little bit of a more practical perspective. Yeah, okay, fine. Saddam Hussein was a dictator and so was Gaddafi, but they also were not the religious zealots. They were the ones keeping them all in check. 
Yeah. And then Gaddafi... Him, I, and then we, we got a mess. And didn't he share some of the oil stuff with his people, too? That he gave people... Yeah. Uh, when they got married, he gave them a bunch of money and a house. And, mm -hmm. So, I mean, he was a, bene, you know, a um, you know, benevolent dictator. Well, yeah, he wasn't, you know, ruthless or something like that. I mean, um, but I don't know. We, like I said, we've always... We have these people that can't sleep at night unless they have an enemy. Yeah. So how do we, the minions, survive this thing? And that's what your your work is about, right? Trying to help people to navigate yeah. geopolitics and money run Armstrong economics, right? That's what What's you gonna do. What's going to happen that's is what you we do. go through these periods every, you know, a few hundred, couple years, a couple hundred years. And uh, mm. the last time was the American Revolution. Whoa. All right, we <laughs> rose up against monarchy. Yes, sir. Okay. This time, uh, our computer showing after 2032, we're going to be looking at new forms of government again. Uh, this time, it's going to be against republics. Republics. Uh, which is what we have. <laughs> we right. don't have Const a democracy. Constitutional That's not, republic, right? Uh, democracy, we would be voting, do we go into Iraq or not? Yeah. Um, with <clears throat> our... A republic, I mean, I can run for office and say, vote for me, I'll create peace, I'll do this, I'll do whatever, it all sounds good. I get down there and, I, and then they say, no, you're going to vote the way we tell you to vote. You know, so you get these party line votes back, you know, and that's a republic. A republic is, I'm your rep, I would be your representative. So I'm the one that votes on these issues, not you. Well, I thought a republic was better than a democracy because it's not majority rules and they can't tell you that you have to have a yellow house just because everybody else has a blue house. But am I got that backwards? Yeah, I think you do. Uh, republics okay. uh, can be... Ver the problem with a republic is that historically they tend to be the most corrupt forms of government. Ever. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, good. Um, that's why Caesar crossed the Rubicon. Huh. And, I mean, the level of corruption, <clears throat> it was Julius Caesar that created the calendar. Before Rome used the moon calendar, they knew it wasn't accurate. So the high priest was in charge of inserting the leap days, okay? Hmm. So the politicians would just bribe them. Say, we don't want to go to, to uh, uh, an election right now. Give us a couple months. Oh, okay, fine. <laughs> so when Caesar crossed the Rubicon... He's crossing in summertime, but the calendar said it was it should have been winter. It was that messed up. Wow. So, you know, when Caesar came in, again, it was mostly the fake news that a lot of people have heard about written by Cicero. But when Caesar crossed the Rubicon, all the cities cheered him. The people in the Senate who were the corrupt Republicans, basically, at that, at that stage, they fled. Brutus, Cicero, they all fled. All right. Um, and so there was no major battle in Rome to seize the, the, the power or whatever. Everybody cheered Caesar. I mean, so it was more or less, it was what we've heard a lot of it, you know, was written by Cicero, who was one of the oligarchs, <laughs> really. Um, so, I mean, republics are very bad because you can bribe them. It, he has no self-interest to defend whatever. I'll give you a million dollars. You say, you know, vote for this. Oh, okay, fine. Okay. So you get drug companies with absolute immunity. Self, I mean, come hmm. on. Uh, it's just not. So how would that, that be that different? People's interest? Of course not. How would that be different under a pure democracy? A democracy, uh, a direct democracy, certainly is plausible right now. Um you know, okay, fine, you know, if Biden wants to go into uh, Ukraine or send them weapons, all right? Everybody's got to vote. You go online, okay, fine, yes. Oh, yeah, and, well, you know, that's not, not going to happen, right? That's never No, happen. it's not, because they don't want us to have that kind of power. Uh, wow, that would be a pure, um, a legitimate democracy. But, yeah, you know, yeah, it, it's, yeah, yeah. It, it that I think is we're voting in our own self interest. Not somebody is not going to come down here and give everybody a million dollars to vote for them. You know, yeah. it's just uh, it's just the way it is. 
my understanding too that all of these, most of these, I don't know, maybe all of them, these executive orders, that they're not really constitutional or legal no. or lawful, are they? They're just making this stuff up, Martin, aren't they? It's it it circumvents even a republic. Yeah. It, it's making yeah. it a dictatorship, basically. Wow. Wow. Um, <clears throat> and Biden signs these things because he knows if it went to to Capitol Hill, it wouldn't pass. Um, so, I mean, that's why <clears throat> Russia came out just now and said, if you send these weapons, we will uh, start also attacking. And how is he in, uh, proposing to do it by executive order? To send the weapons? Yeah. So Congress wouldn't even necessarily have a vote on it. Hmm. What about the old it, idea that you have to have congressional approval to go to war? Where, where did that, where, how did you lose that one? That's a declaration of war. He's not declaring war. Yeah, never did. He's right. just giving them the weapons so they can do it. <laughs> the Proxy. joke is, you know, we'll fight to the very last Ukrainian's dead. <laughs> These poor Ukrainians. God. As long as we don't send in the troops, it's not a war, right? God love them. Man, I tell you what. Just crazy. So, so this is interesting. This is from CJ. So, is your guess saying that oil in 2023 could be $250 a barrel? How can we make money off of that? Okay, he was listening to you, Martin Armstrong. <laughs> Just, you know, pay attention to the oil market. Uh, it's... Uh, <clears throat> You, you have these politicians in Europe going nuts, actually saying that they want to, you know, Germany saying they want to be completely free of uh, Russian oil by and, and gas by the end of the year. Right. How are you going to do that? Um, you know, the, you know, prices are just going up. That's it. That's it. And then you also have these climate change people who realize that the tide might go against them. All right. And Biden's administration is basically all about climate change. Yes. He did an executive order again, you know, to increase solar panels and stuff. Yeah, Defense Production Act a couple of days yeah. ago, right? Yeah, yeah. Solar, heat pumps, and Another, insulation. you know, executive yeah. decree. Mm -hmm. you know? Um, wow. So the, these people want to destroy as much capacity to produce fossil fuels so that if they do lose power the other side can't regenerate the other side can't regenerate if the republicans got in for example ah, and reverse all their decisions you know <clears throat> mm -hmm, um mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so they realize they have a short string on this thing yeah biden's not going to be able to run in 2024 i mean um i, don't have I mean it's 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 a joke really um but i mean so, as you know i mean i used to be part of the whole vetting process to make presidents i, I mean, know you did but before 99 it was i would go meet them and and if somebody wanted to run for president they said i was there to advise them on the world economy but i was also supposed to see if there was a light on and then after 99, you know, uh, Bush Jr., they said, oh, we want you to go down and meet him. I said, yeah, okay, fine. They said, oh, this one's different. I said, what's different? And, well, he's kind of stupid. <laughs> what? Um, and ever <laughs> since then, you know, Biden is the, the end result. Um, wow. So did you, go down and see, did, did you go down and see George? Cabinet. Did you go down and yeah, see what, George W.? Was, was he kind of stupid? No, I didn't go see him. Oh, you, you I, didn't I, go see him. I, I kind of said, that's it. I'll, I'll, you know, I'm not into this sort of thing. Um, <laughs> but when the president sits in the cabinet room. Yes, sir. Each agency's fighting for power. They're mm. like children. Mm. Mm. All right. And, um, he's the one that's supposed to make the decisions. And he's incapable of that. I mean, look at Afghanistan. That's what you got. Yeah. You know, everybody's acting their own, no coordination, and it was just a total mess. But from their perspective, they didn't like hearing no. They didn't like Donald Trump because he was against war. Um, I did go to his Mar-a-Lago for dinner, uh, and I was quite surprised. Mm -hmm. But he 
uh, stood up there. This is, you know, before he left office. And I was actually impressed by the fact that he said that he was disturbed by having to write letters for, you know, uh, to kids' parents who, and he died in Afghanistan. And he said, I'm taking the troops out of there. What are we there for? He says, they've been fighting over these borders for a thousand years. What difference are we going to make? Wow. And he was the first head of state or even senior member that ever seemed to actually address that issue about our boys dying for what? Hmm. And then you have Bolton come out and saying, oh, uh, this is treason. You know, he doesn't know what he's doing, taking us out of Afghanistan. They want to fight everywhere all the time for everything, as long as it's not their kid. So that's one of the reasons, in your opinion, that they want to trump out and did the whole Russian thing and everything because of his aversion to war and NATO. Oh, yeah. WHO. See, he was the same thing as Kennedy. Yeah. The two thing. of them were interesting that Kennedy was against going into Vietnam. Yes, sir. Uh, they took him out. <clears throat> they just didn't want to assassinate uh, Trump because then you might have to look at his picture on a 25 cent coin, you know. <laughs> um, oh, oh, God. So generally, uh, you felt like Trump was, uh, you use your words, and before we'll do a little break here, but uh, what kind of guy was him? What do you think he is deep down? And do you think he's a pretty good guy and means well and just big ego? Or you, you, what Yeah, do you think? I mean, look, he grew up with a silver spoon in his mouth, but he was always criticized. Oh, you really didn't do this. This was daddy's money. So um, I think he really wanted to become president to say, this is what I've done. Oh, yeah. And you yeah. can't say it was my daddy, you know, yeah. that sort yeah. of thing. Um, that makes sense. So that makes sense. I think that, I mean, I've met a lot of world leaders and he impressed me more, I would say. And the only other one that seemed to be really genuine was Ronald Reagan. Really? And hmm. Margaret Thatcher. Yeah, I was going to ask uh, about her, the Iron Lady. She she was pretty cool, pretty, pretty solid. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah. she actually cared. Hmm. Um, really? really? And it was, you know, uh, I went to her place for Christmas dinners. I mean, she was, hmm. she came and spoke at one of our conferences. I mean, it was very, uh, I was very, very impressed with her. Um, Fascinating. And we would actually, you know, discuss, you know, politics and international issues. And, um, you know, I saw that she really cared. Where most of these other politicians, honestly, if I walked in and said, look, if 25 million people are going to die tomorrow unless we do this, they would say, ah, maybe you're wrong. Uh, <clears throat> they'd rather the people die and then say, vote for me, or I'll get the guy that did it. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. from their perspective, like if I was going to run for president and I said, OK, vote for me because I saved your job. You're going to look at me and say, how do I know I would have lost it? <laughs> it's better you lose it, and then I, then I say, vote for me, I'll get the guy that did it. Right, right, right. There's no credit, you know, from their perspective, there is no credit for doing something proactive. I, I wonder how, knowing all you know how this thing works, how they, whoever they are, and you know who they are better than anybody, um, allowed Trump to even get in in 16. <clears throat> They were totally blindsided by it. Really? You think? The, the polls were on the opposite side. CNN and the press, they were showing him all the time, <clears throat> trying to make him as a fool. And so that they thought, you know, that would make sure that he would be the candidate. And they thought he would lose mm -hmm. against Hillary. And it was just the exact opposite. Um, when I w went to Washington and, and they were they were beside themselves. Yeah. I mean, even the Republicans, they were like, what? And I said, you didn't understand. This was a vote against you, not a vote for him. Huh. What? What yeah. happened? What happened? Yeah, so, and even in yeah. Davos, <clears throat> uh, after he was elected, they were there was a, a panic. They even John Kerry started calling, it was no longer democracy, it was populism. 
Oh, evil populism, you see, because suddenly the people voting could throw these career politicians out of office. They didn't like that. Um, so when they structured the EU, it's just a farce. You get to vote for a minister of parliament, but the parliament has no power to overrule the commission. All right. The commission never stands for election. They're appointed. Hmm. The head of Europe, uh, she's elected by the by the other heads. Nobody stands for election. You know, then they criticize Putin. Oh, you know, he's you know just nominated by the people in the Duma. Well, so is the head of the EU. That's how they. It's do exactly it. the same system. That's how they. Do. Uh, okay. Uh, this is from Patrick. Oh, another Patrick. Can your guest uh, give us a definition of neocon? I keep hearing this term, but I don't understand who they are or what their agenda is. It's a good question. Neocon, <laughs> neoconservative. Who are these people, and what do they want? They basically are always warmongers, uh, and mm -hmm. they're both sides. They're not Republicans or, de or, or Democrats. They're on both sides. Okay. So Hillary Clinton was one, as, as you know, Lindsey Graham. Uh, you find they work together, like the McGinsky Act against Russians was all, you know, orchestrated and aided by Hillary, introduced by uh, John McCain. Mm -hmm. You know, um, they cross, you know, the economics are a sideline to them. Who supports you know, these the, people? Who, who supports them? Globalists? Like military the establishment. Uh, um, military, yeah. Um, NATO, you know, hmm. they... <clears throat> They conjure up all, all sorts of things. I mean, even like, you know, the, the propaganda against Putin. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's, oh, well, he was an old KGB right. uh, and wanted to resurrect the, the Soviet Union. I've read the, the declassified uh, documents from the Clinton administration. They're online. You can read them. And they're saying absolutely the opposite. He was selected because he was more democratic, he was neutral, and Yeltsin had a problem. He had enemies among the oligarchs, Baraznovsky group, and he also had the communists, the old hardline communists who wanted the, the USSR, had even moved for impeachment against them. Hmm. So he selected Putin, and, he, and there's even declassified phone calls with Clinton saying, I want to introduce him. He's a Democrat and he, stay, he will continue the policies. And then there's another uh, phone call, you know, declassified, I read. And it's uh, and Clinton's gone. He's a very smart man. Interesting. <laughs> you know, Interesting. It's exactly the opposite. opposite. If you just, you know, what they you, sound. Yeah. It, it, look, he's had 25 years. Has he invaded any? country no. and, and it, no, he, uh, has, no he tried to reestablish the ussr no he even came out and said you know lenin was just the uh, bolshevik <laughs> they were speculating if he would remove his 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 tomb uh i mean he was not a communist he was against communism huh. so but um, he did have a stint trying to get into afghanistan and steal their stuff didn't he wasn't that putin no, that was Georgia, actually. Oh. Uh, uh, the the oh. Afghanistan was before, but well, was that before um, Putin? Pre Putin? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hmm. He okay. went into Chechnya. Maybe that's what you're thinking about. Oh no, I know. No, I was just thinking. Uh, I didn't realize that the whole Afghanistan thing with Russia was before Putin. It's been that yeah, long. Yeah, that was ago. 1989. Wow. They invaded. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have to do a break here. Stay right there, <laughs> will you? Uh, Martin Armstrong, this is fun. Love talking to him. It's fun. And this is Patrick Timpone, OneRadioNetwork.com. This is a technology that uh, we just uh, saw a recent paper that has proven that uh, breathing hydrogen actually um, helps with this yellow fat disease that Adam Bergstrom talks about, fatty liver, which is one of the big ones in this country all around the world because of bad oils like canola oil, corn oil, um, all these oils, so you know, they fry McDonald's in um, soybean oil, 
you know, McDonald's, the, the healthiest thing they have is the meat. You know, just eat the meat and throw away the bun and no fries and you'd be fine. But, um, and this, this fat thing in the liver is huge. And hydrogen, this is just one new thing. And we're going to post this study. And so check it out. This is a really nice technology that you can buy from us. This is from a previous show with Dr. Mark Circus. So three months ago, a study that was published in Dove Press, brain metastasis completely disappear in non-small cell lung cancer using hydrogen gas inhalation. A case study done in China, a 44-year-old woman diagnosed with multiple metastases. What, what's a metastasis? It means it's spread. It's, it's, it's spreading. It's, it's, it's spreading. not just one two tumor, it's you have multiple tumors. Uh -huh. The kind of case where there's no hope, doctors give up hope, complete remission using hydrogen gas. Really? In terms of brain cancer, and of course, in my hydrogen book, which people can download from my site, quite a bit of information about using hydrogen for cancer and the many reasons and studies that lead up to that. But this, this study that I'm talking about today, it's, um, it's like taking a two, two by four and smashing it over the sign of modern oncology. Like, wake up, boys. Here's something simple, something you should be doing anyway, that happens to help people with the worst forms of cancer almost doomed to die. We are not making any claims because we don't do that around here. We don't do no claimies. But who knows? Uh, a lot of studies. You can go to molecularhydrogeninstitute.com. Look at some of the studies. Most of them are out of China and Japan on using molecular hydrogen, helping people who have had strokes uh, to recover uh, faster, quicker, better, and actually really recover, which is quite a good thing. Um so it's very interesting technology. Uh, we're in August, it'll be three years for Patrick. And I breathe this gas every day of my life when I'm working on my screenplays and, um, and exercising or whatever I do downstairs. They have a 25-foot cannula, and you can just, um, you know, just breathe, it, uh, breathe away, baby. Just breathe away. Um, and then drink the water. And I have my little hydrogen water here. It's pretty cool. Check it out. Use promo code one radio. Promo code one radio, one radio, and you get a twenty percent discount going on right now. Not sure how long the discount will happen. Uh, will be happening rather twenty percent promo code one radio on one radio network dot com. I know I've known Brandon Amalani forever, long time. He used to work with Daniel Vitalis for twelve years. If you go to Shen Blossom through his website, he's a Chinese medicine guy and he's really into stuff and do it, he does it really well. He has a blood detoxification purifier thing, a rise male potency formula. I take that baby every day because someday I'm gonna marry, get married and have kids. It, well, you know, takes a long time to get young, you know. Athletic performance, sexual health, prostate health, hormone health, blood sugar, emotional balance, deep sleep. I'm still working on that one. It hasn't worked on that, but everything else. Hoshu Wu, it's a great formula. It's for kidneys, which is also tied in with sexual health and libido. So if you want to do things south of the border, I would work on Arise. Also, his 50-year-old ginseng. 50-year-old ginseng. This is just a step above the ginseng you'll get the, at the Circle K. on the. Just kidding. Really great company. This is Shen Blossom on OneRadioNetwork.com. Check them out. Great products. They're all in Myron Glass. I think you'll really enjoy uh, the products that you have there. He's got some great things for digestion. Just uh, really, really, really fun. Okay, here we go. Broadcasting from the beautiful Hill Country in Texas, this is one radionetwork.com. We're having fun talking with uh, Martin Armstrong. Martin Armstrong, thanks for coming on the show. Really appreciate it from time to time. Oh, it's always, always a pleasure. You're always very kind when you come on. For, I always email your, your assistant. She said, sure, he'll come on. He likes to come on. So this is, this is fun. 
Uh, tell folks about your website and what they'll find there and can the, what kind of services do you offer? I know you're doing webinars and all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, well, we have um, uh, armstrongeconomics.com. You don't even have to register to get in. We try to keep that as an open platform for uh, as a public service. Uh, we do have uh, annual conferences, but you know they're a little more, more pricey. They're generally around, you know. Um, I think the streaming one, which goes around the world, is maybe about fifteen hundred dollars a year, or for an event. Um, and the attending is like twenty five hundred or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't, I don't, I'm not really involved in. I just show up on the stage, you know. So. Um, <laughs> So, and these conferences, do you talk to big high rollers and companies and that talk to them about what you see and what the computer sees of what's going to happen? Yeah, that's oh. it. The <clears throat> computer is the forecaster, basically. Uh-huh. And uh, it's monitoring absolutely everything on a global scale. All right. So it, that makes it easier to. Um, and more objective to do a for, to forecast. It, I mean, uh, we the computer puts out an array for uh, twelve units of time. So on a yearly basis, you can see where the turning points are going to be even twelve years out. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's all done by basically the the computer. What I've learned about capital flows and and how capital really moves around the world. Uh, Everything I could get my hands on, it, it is in there. You just put uh, it in. It, it, the computer is a, a fully functioning uh, artificial intelligence system, actually the only one in the world. Is that um, right? hmm. And it physically writes itself over a thousand forecasting reports on instruments and everything around the world every day. Uh, so there's not enough analysts in the world to be able to do all that. So, um, and how I, long has Socrates been around? This guy, this computer guy. <laughs> I first created it in the 1970s. Wow! Um, wow! Hmm. And you know, it it has taught me a lot. Hmm. And, and I'll just give you one example uh, on war. Uh, that uh, <clears throat> in the early 80s, we had one client, Universal Bank of Lebanon, and they had. <clears throat> found a book with all the Lebanese pound back to like mid 19th century asked us if we could create a model I said sure we you know they sent it over we put it in and the computer came out and said their country was going to fall apart in eight days so I thought something was wrong I called them I said look there's got to be something wrong with this data it says your country is going to fall apart in eight days and they very calmly said to me well what currency do you think would be best and I was like very yeah, I was like, huh? That's kind of a strange response. I said, well, it says the Swiss franc. Okay, fine. Thank you. Eight days later, the Civil War began. No kidding. Then I had a client in Saudi Arabia who was big in shipping. And he called me up and he says, uh, what do you think gold's going to do tomorrow? Uh, <clears throat> Iraq's going to start attacking shipping in the Gulf. I said, are you telling me a, a war is going to start tomorrow? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What do you think gold's going to do? Um, so then in 98, by then I'm, I began to realize that it was able to project geopolitical th- events like that because if you didn't know you were going to invade something, what did you do? You moved your money in advance. So it was picking up the capital was, movement. Wow, capital flows. That, interesting. Um, yeah. hmm. The U.S. government used that theory to, to check on options for 9-11, who was buying them. Um, and so in 98, uh, in, <clears throat> we had a conference in London. I stood up and I said, look, uh, Russia is going to collapse in about, you know, I give it about 30 days. Uh, I didn't realize that a guy was uh, from the London Financial Times. It snuck in the back. And he ends up putting that on the front page of the newspaper. <laughs> Of course, that was the ninety, you know, the ninety-eight crash, long-term capital management. The Fed had to step in, all that that nonsense. And that's when the CIA came to us and said they wanted me to build this model for them. And I said, "Look, it took me seventeen years to build this thing. I'm not doing that." I said, "Well, 
I'll be glad to run any study you wanted. And my confrontation with them began at that point. They said, no, we have to own it. I said, I'm sorry, it's not for sale. Not for sale. Um, and so it's, it, it's been <clears throat> used by everybody, you know, just about every central bank around the world. I mean, um, we've gotten called in mainly because it's objective. It's not my personal opinion. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So like when the 97 uh, Asian currency crisis happened, I was the one called in to uh, Beijing. So I met with the Central Bank of China then. Um, you know, so I've, I've met with just about all of them. I mean, even the Swiss before the peg with the euro broke. I warned them. I said I met with them maybe about three weeks before. I said, this is going to break. You can't do this. And they said, oh, well, we think we can we can hold it. I said, well, I think history is on my side. Nobody's ever been able to do it once. And it broke in about, you know, about, I think it was about three weeks later. Yes, um, hmm. So it, it looks at objectively at the capital flows. Hmm. Well, in Russia, we saw $100 billion going in, but we saw $150 billion coming out. Um so it picks that up and it, and it shows what's happening. For example, if China was really to invade the United States, what would they do? They'd sell all the U.S. government bonds in advance. Of course. Right. They got, and and they got about a trillion. Right? Invade and watch their you know, trillion dollars go out the window. You know? yeah. uh, <laughs> so it, there are certain human responses that naturally take place. Uh, and... Um, it's a lot of people follow, you know, I just about every, I think, intelligence agency in the world follows it now <laughs> because I won't, I won't sell it. I see. So, so with all this going on, do you think there's a, a long-term relationship between China, Russia, maybe, maybe India, Iran, these folks to, to do their own little new world order thing on what they think is better than Davos? Yeah, I mean, Davos is basically uh, just a joke. Even yeah. uh, the head of Brazil, and he was there a couple of years ago, he said these people are all fake. Um, and look, it, it's what Biden has done was absolutely brain dead. It, it's the most stupid thing he could have ever possibly done, putting these sanctions on Russia. Yes. Uh, and. <clears throat> trying to remove them from SWIFT, You're, <clears throat> that suddenly is a warning sign to China. Hey, forget it. You better, and they are going full-blown on their um, their chip system, which is the alternative to SWIFT. So to Swift, yeah. Biden has, has actually, you know, no propaganda, no, he has destroyed the world economy. Wow. Uh, it it is splitting in half, uh, and uh, you know part of that. You know, if Russia is so important, um, it is the wealthiest nation in the world from resource perspective, uh, energy, food. I mean, thirty percent of the wheat supply basically comes from Ukraine and, and Russia. So you're looking at food shortages uh, around the world. Uh, it energy prices, but by doing this, you just had a a revolution in Pakistan. The head Khan he came out and blamed the CIA. No, sorry, it wasn't. You know, people are living hand to mouth in a lot of these third world countries. They are. You raise energy prices like that that has taken place, and that's it. They can't feed their kids. All right. We're, yes, Americans are hurt, okay, by, I used to fill up my core, it was 25, now it's like 55, you know, uh, but we're surviving. Third world countries, they're not. Yes, sir. All right, and emerging markets, they issued their debt in dollars so they could sell it. So you just had, as the dollar then goes up because of the Ukrainian war, and all the capital coming into the United States, mm-hmm. Sri Lanka defaults because their debts in dollars. Lebanon defaults. All right. So you're looking at a spread of 
<clears throat> sovereign defaults also now emerging, all because of Putin's, you know, uh, they say Putin's invasion. But these are the sanctions that Biden has done. And I'll point out when <clears throat> Putin did, you know, take Crimea back in 2014, Obama tried that. He went to Swift and wanted them to be taken out. Swift said no. Well, they changed the leadership in, at SWIFT in 2019. And this guy goes, oh, okay, fine, no problem. You know, and he just signed his own death warrant. You know, SWIFT is, is no longer independent. It can't be trusted. So <clears throat> they have now shown the world that the, they are a political tool. Hmm. And, and so China, why would you use it? And China and Russia, they were working on an alternative for a long time. They kind of knew this was coming, right? I I think the Chinese were pretty smart about that. Yeah, yeah, um, they, they know, they know. Right? And uh, you know, China has is far more intelligent than people understand. Um, hmm. Like I said, I've been there. Uh, I've I've you know talked to the government. I've I've seen how it it actually functions all right <clears throat> germany may be the strongest economy in europe but if you look on net worth basis uh germans are nearly at the bottom of the list hmm. because their taxes are so high uh the average person doesn't have as much net worth as someone in italy so <clears throat> The reason is their economic policy was always about um, export oriented. Let's build some BMWs, sell them to everybody else, and then we bring the money home. Yeah. Right. Whereas the United States became the world's largest economy because it was a consumer economy. Everybody wanted to make something to sell to the United States because we had the people who would buy it. All right. A different economic model. China has looked at the United States model and looked at Germany. China is building its, its Silk Road, as they say. It, is, uh, it has understood more than, I would say, our own politicians. And they realize that they have to be self-sufficient. They're building their own domestic consumer market. All right. And that is what will compete against the United States, and already probably by next year they'll be listed as the number one uh, largest economy in the world. Huh. Domestic consumer market, meaning they're going to make stuff and sell to the Chinese rather than... Exactly. Yeah, yeah right, right. So right. by doing that, you also are severing the ties to the United States. You're not as dependent upon the United States to survive. Okay, so that allows them at that point to... Um, sell the U.S. debt and say, fine, you want war? No problem. <laughs> no problem. Uh, can, you, can we compare uh, the inflation today going on and what's going to be happening with the increase in the money supply to the 70s when gold went, what was it, Martin Armstrong, from 50 bucks to 800 mm -hmm. over 10 years, right? Huge increase, like, like 2,000% or something. And then... Treasuries got up to about what fifteen percent when gold went to eight fifty. Wasn't around in nineteen eighty. Um, do you think we're going to see that, where then the interest rates will get that high this this time? Uh, <clears throat> no, I mean that was kind of Paul Volcker, right? And he was looking at the price of gold as as the real inflation. Uh, he was wrong. Um, I even spoke to Paul before he had died about you know some of these decisions, but um, <clears throat> what you have to understand back then, what's similar is that we have a, uh, a shortage and that's what was developing back then. So uh, the OPEC <clears throat> shock uh, increased the cost of production on so many things. So you had people hoarding you know toilet paper etc back then too um and that's where the term stagflation came into play mm -hmm. because the inflation rate was higher than the economic growth that's what we're back to now 
All right, so shortages. <clears throat> um, the reason this whole thing's coming apart is because Keynesian economics is failing. Um, when it was developed in the 30s, uh, <clears throat> Herbert Hoover was running balanced budgets. Okay, so the idea of raising interest rates, lowering interest rates was to ma manipulate us, not the government. Mm -hmm. After World War II, they just have been spending uh, like a drunken sailor, you know, uh, really. Um, <clears throat> no offense to sailors, but no. <laughs> um, um, that there's just been no responsibility at all. So they think, oh, it's the Fed's uh, job to stop the inflation. We'll spend whatever we want. And it doesn't work that way. Can't do it. So now the Fed can raise interest rates will it stop inflation no it would actually create it, it because create it because it causes the cost of production to rise on everything okay and we have the biggest borrower is government so does it stop them from borrowing and spending no hmm. they just no. spend more they spend more um, so the whole keynesian model the idea has failed. That's what the central banks are in this crisis about. So it, they have no tools to work. They can't prevent this um, inflation with raising interest rates, lowering it. That's it's got not going to do anything. So, because so the only thing they can do is keep creating more money at the Fed and loaning it to whoever, or buy and or buying equities, or buying mortgage-backed securities. God knows what they buy. Um, it's yeah, it's the Fed is probably the most independent central bank. Um, it at least understands an, an, a lot of this problem, whereas Europe is just it's cut its throat. And there's no <laughs> way uh, for it no, to even function. No way out. No way out. Huh? Um, hmm. <clears throat> they've been in negative interest rates since 2014. That's negative interest rates. Negative interest rates for eight years, and it has failed to stimulate the economy. Um, so it, it, we're looking at the very economic theories are all just falling apart. So this is a big deal. That's the real problem. Right, this is a big deal for the last 200 years, right? Or since the Fed from 1913. Yeah, right? this is it's why everything is, 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 is falling apart. Um, Keynes had said... <clears throat> In a depression, you can have a deficit to help, you know, compensate for the decline in the demand from the public sector. Mm -hmm. These guys, once they got in power, gee, you know, deficits are okay. So they spent money in a deficit even when we were in a boom. Uh, what happens to this 32, it's probably 32 or 5 trillion. I think they cooked the books on the... The, the bonded debt. What, what happens to this? This is obviously never going to be paid. No, right? it, it's, what do you do with that? What do you, what do you, do you Well, the, I mean, the last time they just basically converted it to another currency. That's what Alexander Hamilton did. Uh, we had continental currency before. And he said, OK, fine, we'll give you for every hundred of those. We'll give you one of these. Um, <laughs> Great. They do a bait and switch, basically. Um, uh, these are much worth a lot more than those. You see, these are better. So, so you think they're going to try to do that with the central bank digital currencies? Things? Yeah, I mean that's do the it? whole. Object. That's the whole idea. Right? The digital currency is also a fraud in the sense that I mean I've met with governments for like forty years. They will never admit that they are the culprit. I, that's why I say there's no mirrors in in Washington. At no, all. nothing. So. The problem is, is that they wouldn't, from their perspective, they wouldn't have these deficits if we paid all our taxes. If we paid all our taxes? Yeah, and they think everybody's cheating our ta on oh. taxes. Oh, great. Yelling up there wanting to lower it to a $600 and, you know, reporting, you know, if you bought a sofa for $600, I mean, come on. Um and had the audacity to say, well, this is to get billionaires. Yeah, right. Um, 
you have to understand the way they do this. Even when the income tax was put in place, the promise is, oh, you'll never have to pay. This is, we're only going after the rich. Well, the definition of the rich always changes, hmm. right? Uh, so then World War II comes, oh, well, uh, and Social Security. Well, in order to do the Social Security, we need the payroll tax, you see. We'll oh, take yeah. it, Social hmm. Security out of the... So now everybody's into, into you know... Um, you know, income taxes, and then if you don't pay the income tax, you go to prison, failure to file, you know. Sure, yeah. Um, hmm. Even, you know, inheritance taxes, it's, that's what's destroyed a lot of the farming in the country. Because <clears throat> you had maybe, you know, 500 acres or something, you die, you leave it to your, oh, well, now it's worth this, so you've got to pay this much taxes, inheritance tax now forces you to sell some of the land just to pay the tax. Mm -hmm. yeah. So then you have corporate farming coming in because they're buying up all these small farms because they couldn't pay the taxes. And property taxes they, around the country are, are going up everywhere. Boy, everywhere. Everywhere. Absolutely Every, everywhere. Florida, Texas are huge, right? Because everybody's moving there, so they're raising the property taxes. <laughs> yeah, look, this is, this is what's going on. It's um, Wow. They can't live without taxes because, honestly, we don't need them. Um, you only need them on a, on a local level. That's it. Um, why do we have income taxes if they can print the money that they need to spend anyhow? Well, exactly. I mean, just print what you need. If you go short dollars, you print dollars. And yeah, why it. harass everybody in the country? And let people know? take keep their money and buy stuff. I mean, well, the economy would be much better off. But, yeah. Um, <laughs> if you had a, if you had a microphone and you went on the street, well, you live in Florida, right? Where in a big city near yeah, you? Yeah, Florida. Well, a big city near you is what? Miami or? Uh, no, Tampa. Tampa. Okay. I'm by the, St. Pete. You went on the, the street with a microphone and you asked people if the Federal Reserve Bank of New York is owned is a, a private or a, a government bank. What would they? Nine out of ten people. I mean, how, how many people would say it's it's private? Um, probably not many, really. Yeah. One, um, two, something like that. It, I mean, even that, whether it's, it, the fact that, that in theory, they're owned by independent banks, they, they have are. shareholding in them, yeah. that's been all kind of nullified as well. Uh, when the Fed was created, it was supposed to be like a bailout situation. Right. If one bank was resort. in trouble, yeah. then yeah. they all pulled their money together. So it made sense that they were the shareholders. But then FDR kind of usurped it. Uh, he's the one that brought in, uh, brought it to Washington. Uh, why are there, you know, 13 branches? Each branch, you can go to the library and look at the old newspapers. They all had different interest rates. They were independent back then. So if, if there was too much money in, in Texas, they lowered the rate. And if New York needed money, they raised the rate. So you would move some money to New York to, to get the higher interest rate. Huh. Um, Roosevelt but, usurped all that and made one interest rate for everybody because it was all socialism. So it kind of really got disturbed. And then it was this president that appointed the head of the, of the central bank, not the banks. Hmm. But Martin Armstrong, we, we pay interest on bonded debt. I think it's about $450 billion, maybe $500 billion. If we just created the dollars at Treasury, there would be no interest. They're not doing that. They're still a middleman, the Fed, that are creating the money. Well, yeah, but that's right? not really. that. The Fed only creates a very small amount of the actual physical money, so to speak. Uh, the bulk of that debt that they're paying interest on is is the national debt which Congress issues, not the Fed. No way, but Congress didn't issue the money, though. The Fed always issues the new money. Only the physical money. The right. Congress, all right, it's all electronic. It, the debt, that $500 billion is the role the national debt, not what yes. the Fed, Fed has. Yeah, but again, if we just created Treasury, like... United States notes or something, there would be no debt. I mean, just create what you need. Why do you need? If we did, if we stop borrowing, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
Yeah. But then you have a problem of, uh, I think, honestly, politicians don't know how to run for office anymore. It's like, vote for me and I'll take money from this guy and I'll give it to you. Um, and it's like, vote for me, I'll give you this. I'll give you that. It's always bribing the people. Sure. Nobody runs for office and says, vote for me, I'll be more, I'll run it you know, properly. No, you never hear that. Hmm. Um, it's vote for me. I'll stop global warming. I'll do this. I'll do. It, it's always some sort of crisis that they they don't know how to run and say, look, I would be a better manager to run the government like a CEO of a company. Yeah, Richard um, wants to know. Uh, can you guess? Uh, conjecture, great word. Uh, who are the people other than the MAGA crowd that are supporting Donald Trump to run again? Do you know any of the big boys or the money people, the peeps that want Donald Trump to 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 run? Uh, not that I know of. Uh -huh. um, mm -hmm. They were, you know, Facebook and that crowd. They were being promised uh, to go against Trump, and they would be able to be banks with their digital currencies, oh. and that they would be replacing. Uh, the banks. Uh, you can probably Google and find some articles that the Federal Reserve will take direct deposits oh. from people. Hmm. All right. Um, <clears throat> if the Federal Reserve took direct deposits from people, you're now competing with the banks. So uh, Facebook and, and the rest of these with their digital currencies, they were promised that. Oh. That's why they were all against Trump. Oh. It was just follow the money. That and that Facebook digital currency thing, that thing just fell apart, didn't it? Somewhere yeah. along the line. Just fell apart somewhere. This is another great question from Linda. She's in Seattle. Oh, God bless Seattle. You need help there. Uh does your guest believe that Bitcoin long term survives anything everything? Mm. Probably not. Probably um, not. Really? No. Who who could bring them down? Aren't they peer to peer, Martin Armstrong and kind of the way it's set up? Look, I don't see that as plus or minus, honestly. Hmm. Uh, if we went into war and just look at what the U.S. did to Iraq, the first thing you do is you take out the power grid. Yeah. Okay, so where's oh, your I see. So if you bring that, Yeah, well, then you're done, right? It, it game, um, over. game over. I think still, historically, it's going to come back to physical you know, a medium of exchange. Um, and I, I guess an example was uh, probably the most dramatic collapse was that of Japan. The emperor, uh, every new emperor that came in for a few of, of a run, he devalued all the money that was in circulation to 10% of the new ones that he issued. Um <laughs> So it got to the point that people would no longer accept Japanese coins because they would be devalued. Mm -hmm. So they started money was used as bags of rice and they used Chinese coins. Uh, China uh, expanded that way, but Japan actually physically lost the, the ability to issue money for 600 years. You know, no Japanese coins for 600 years wow. because, because the emperors were screwing around so much. Hmm. Uh, nobody would trust them. Not until the Meiji period where coins ever, you know, reappeared. So, uh, you know, I think that's, you know, if you get into like a war situation, things of this nature, um, even cutting off the energy that, that, um, you know, the Biden administration is doing. They're talking about rolling blackouts uh, in the United States maybe this summer. You get a blackout, what good is Bitcoin going to do you? Or any digital currency, regardless uh, of who makes it. But it wouldn't have come back on and you'd still have your Bitcoin if it was off. If it was off yeah, I'm not saying line, it right? that would. Yeah. Hmm. But you have, um, I think largely the government, <clears throat> Knowing these people the way I do, they would just seize Bitcoin and everything else, anyhow. You think they could? And convert they, it they to their make, digital currency. They, oh, we're going to um, convert your Bitcoin to your, our central bank digital currency. Whatever. Uh, yeah. And they would, you know, can do it by an executive order. 
and Biden would do it in a second. All right. But um, <laughs> then <clears throat> they want the digital currencies because blockchain is not private. They can look at if I gave you 100, they can see that who gave it to you, where I did, where I got it from and who you give it to. Sure. Um, sure. It, they can follow the whole chain. That is like their dream. Um, so I'm not thrilled about, you know, you know, Bitcoin. I like a good old hundred dollar bill. I can give you a hundred dollar bill and nobody knows where I got it from. <laughs> and nobody's going to know where you yeah. next guy you gave it to. I mean, you, you you know, like we're losing all privacy with digital currencies. Do you, do you like uh, numismatic coins or uh, numismatics? Yeah. I mean, I think that <clears throat> that's why there's so many $20 gold pieces around and things of that nature. Cause most people don't realize, but FDR, he was a stamp collector. But Teddy Roosevelt was a coin collector. Yeah. So when he confiscated gold, he exempted numismatic coins. He did. Yeah, he did. Uh, that's why they're still around. That was right? Teddy. Um, Good for Teddy. God love him. Yeah, Teddy, you can look at a 1907 $20 gold piece. There's hmm. the very first year, they're very high reliefs. Mm hmm. Uh, he was an ancient coin collector. The ancient coin coins were very high relief because they were hand struck. Mm -hmm. uh, so they tried to make them like that. That's what he wanted, and the machines would break. So, 1907, for a little period of time, um, the very high reliefs, and the date was in Roman numerals. Wow. Very. Well, did you, back in 80 and 81, when, when the interest rates were very high, were you advising people to just go ahead and buy a 30-year treasury and get 15% for the next 30 years? I mean, wow. Was that a no-brainer or, or what? Well, I, <laughs> I can tell you an interesting story there. My Please mother do. and her sister went out virtually at the high. Yeah. And they didn't buy treasuries, but they, they locked in 10-year CD uh, ROM or CD notes at that time. What was the interest and rate? At the high rate. And she didn't ask me. She came back and says, no, that's what I said. She's 20%. Ah, that, why not? I'm not? And she locked it in for 10 years. 20%. And Whoa. My mother picked the high <laughs> without asking. And, <laughs> and her <laughs> So I, you can see, I mean, at that point, why not? You know, and True, that's why you ended up with a deflation into 1985. Because everybody was coming here buying these notes at high levels. Oh. Uh, I met with the Treasury uh, after that, and I said, you realize what you've done here. I said, the national debt's going to you know, double in no time at these rates. And they just said, yeah, Marty, but we'll be paying back with cheaper dollars. I said, all right. I walked out. This is, that was a, that was my meeting with the Treasury over the issue. Yeah, fifteen twenty percent. Everybody and their brother wants to buy your debt. Absolutely. Right? Yeah, absolutely. That's why they, the dollar went to all time highs in nineteen eighty five. The British pound went to one hundred three. Wow, wow. Virtually par. And, and you've talked about as sovereign debt people going belly up in Sri Lanka and other places, but the odds of the United States Treasury ever defaulting on a Treasury bond, that would be, those odds would be high, right? I guess it could happen someday. Yeah. At the end of the cycle, the okay. U.S. would be It'd the be last game over. one. Yeah, it'd be game over and, then, right? And a lot of people, you know, I know a lot of the gold people keep saying, oh, the dollar's going to crash. They don't understand the game. If the dollar goes up, that's what creates the problem. Because everybody else has issued debt in dollars. Now they owe more. Yes. All right. China, that's why you have the real estate companies in crisis. Uh, China was warning them and their uh, provinces not to borrow in dollars. But they were borrowing dollars because the interest rate was cheaper. Oh. Uh, I saw the same crisis happen in, in Australia. They were all buying uh, their homes and, and were putting in the Swiss francs because with cheaper rates, then they lost their homes, everything blew up. The same thing, you know, they were doing that again in Europe when the, the Euro Swiss franc peg broke. Mm. Um, Swiss franc went up and, and all of a sudden you owe 20% more in your, on your mortgage. Because um, the dollar keeps, your local currency. Dollar and, keeps and, going up, yeah. 
Yeah, it's you know you can't have one asset uh, in one currency and your debt in the other with no hedge. If you don't understand what you're doing, you're in trouble. <laughs> and and big. so the dollar going up is what's hmm. going to blow up most of these. Uh, debt structures in emerging markets, etc. Uh -huh. So yes, the dollar will eventually go down. But first, it has to go up. That takes a lot of it down. That brings the US and the world economy down further. Mm -hmm. um, and the dollar rises in deflation during recessionary periods. Yes, yes. Because what happens is people want to, they sell their assets and they want cash. Mm hmm so the cash is going up in value and your assets are going down. So does Putin with his dollar and, and I mean his ruble and what gold and his resources, does he care what the dollar is these days? Does, does it affect him? No. Um, Germany has just capitulated to pay in rubles. Wow. So um, for the gas and the oil? Trying to keep that kind of quiet. Yeah, for the <laughs> but um, that's, you know, I've got good contacts there in German government and they just capitulated wow. because they, they need the energy. They need it. They, they need it, right? Yet these people say, oh, we're going to cut off Russia. I don't know how they're going to do it. I really don't. Um, you do that and oil is going absolutely berserk um, because they're going to have to pay huge amounts of money for it um, from everywhere else. Maybe that's why Goldman and JP are predicting that maybe they know that they're going to cut off all the all the oil. Huh? Well, they've been saying that, but I mean, our model is showing that this is going to get much worse. I mean, if um, you know, I think part of the the COVID lockdown in China in Shanghai yeah. was deliberately and political uh, for the purpose to create higher inflation. Shanghai was is like the number one port in the world but uh, they just lifted it i think today and it's uh, gonna that'll cause oil to rise as well once they start using yeah oil. all uh, this yeah. you know if, if in waging war hmm. you can probably buy them on um on ebay the germans <clears throat> uh counterfeited british pounds did they and they were dropping them out of planes on the people. <laughs> in there. And, and what you're, you're trying to do is destabilize their currency. You're trying to create the inflation. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's a war tactic. Mm. So I honestly think that that's what China was deliberately doing, uh, shutting down Shanghai in total lockdown to shut down the port to push the inflation even higher. I think it's a war tactic. Mm. Finally, uh, the stock market. So many people, um, you know, got all these ideas what it's going to do. And what, what, what do you think, your computer, Mr. Socrates? Uh, you know, most of our listeners probably have what they have in, in 401ks and, and uh, retirement accounts, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's where they are. Is that dangerous right now? I mean, what do they do? No, I, look, it's, you think it's, yeah, you have a, uh, a decline probably into uh, maybe first quarter of 23. Mm -hmm. But our computer is also showing that, you know, war is going to get much more aggressive next year. Uh -huh. um, it, just look at it this way. I mean, as long as as U.S. is is pulling this nonsense with Ukraine, it's the perfect opportunity for China to go in and take Taiwan. They're going to do that, right? They're going yeah, to do that. Yeah, absolutely. But, I mean, can you <laughs> can the U.S. really afford to fight Russia on one side and China on the other side? I don't think so. Um, it's, I think it's overextending, and and most of this is being driven by these people in the Biden administration who are climate change, and all they care about is that. That's it. They don't right. look at what's happening. Um, globally around the world. Many people conjecture that this climate change is all about more about control, that solar and all these green things can never provide the energy that everybody needs. So if they, if they run this thing up, then they can control the energy and control us even more. Do you think that's a viable argument? <clears throat> it, I think it's more uh, to 
uh, jettison the, the United Nations to this one world government uh, yeah. stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, you will see on our, uh, if you uh, <clears throat> Google our site, there's a clip on there of Holland, H O L L, uh, the old president of France, mm-hmm. uh, standing up alongside Merkel in. <clears throat> Uh, in the European Parliament, admitting that the whole purpose of the EU was to create one government to, to eliminate war in Europe. Oh, this theory's been around for a long time. Yeah, they yeah. think of one government, then there you eliminate war. Mm-hmm. Just look at the Roman Empire. How many civil wars did they have? It was one government. Mm. Um, mm. We had mm. a civil war, North versus South. England had a civil war. One government doesn't matter. But this theory is another academic, you know, utopia. Um, and these people are pushing uh, the United Nations, that the United Nations, uh, we need one government to fight climate change. You now have the WHO saying we need one agency to fight to disease. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. These people are just power hungry. Hmm. That's what it's all about. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I don't see this as... as viable it it is it's absurd but you know they only look in you know at what they want to achieve that's it they don't look at the practicality of this It, it, it appears to me just from the cheap seats martin armstrong from your host here that i don't think these people are going to stop they're going to keep going until they just implode or I mean, yes. right? They're just not going to um, stop, are they? They're not going to stop. No, they're, they're, they're just you're not. asking them to suddenly admit that everything they believe for their life is wrong. <laughs> it's um, like a religion, right? It's like, okay. Yeah, it is. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's not like, going to happen. Not going to um, happen. Wow. Uh, not going to happen. Look, they. this is what our problem is. This is why they wanted Biden. They got somebody that will just sign whatever they stick in front of his nose. Sure. Uh, sure you got to take sure. the napkin and wipe the drool off at first. But... Uh, <laughs> Uh, but, but this is what they wanted you know they got does it. he really come up with these ideas no i i think it's like the old rap song uh with this you know slim real sim you know slady you know shady please stand up i mean yeah. nobody knows who the president really is yeah they have no idea whoever is writing up these things and sticking it in front of them your man in florida is pretty cool desantis he was talking about the who the other day and he says i don't care what they tell me to do in florida we're not going to do it so you know just knock yourself out this is probably where we're going right texas florida tennessee yeah. oklahoma um, we're just gonna the do united states deal. Will probably split split yeah uh, it will split you know usually along the same historic lines that you know were before north versus south um Although, you know, a lot of people have said it was slavery and stuff like that. It wasn't necessarily that was mm-hmm. the real uh, bottom line issue. Uh, it was it was states rights from many perspectives. Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, and most of the soldiers that fought in the war, they didn't have slaves. Uh, it was it was more of we're not going to tolerate the North telling us what to do in the South. Right, right wrong or indifferent. Yeah. All right. All um, right. And back then, uh, you know, cotton and things, this, this was all manual labor. So, you know, if you are taking away the slave labor, you are basically putting them out of business. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so it was, from an economic standpoint, it was, it was different. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, it, this is, you know, I mean, Slavery was was been around for a long time. It was wrong. Uh, that's how communism came to power in Russia. Russia had serfdom. The difference between the two, uh, slavery, I could sell just you. <clears throat> serfdom, if I sold the farm, everybody that was there went with it. Oh, good. <laughs> you were attached to the farm. I see it wasn't an individual per se. Hmm. Um, so serfdom was, um, you know, you belong, you were part of the, the machinery of the farm, basically. And, and uh, so serfdom ended in, Euro- in Russia in 1861. That's why Marxism worked. Because suddenly it was like, let's go get the rich. They got everything. These people had nothing. 
they didn't own anything. Wow. They had always been just like machinery on a farm. That was it. So uh, freeing them was not necessarily the greatest thing since sliced bread. <laughs> yeah. You know, there wasn't McDonald's to go down and get a part-time job or something. You know, it was like there wasn't that kind of a structure there for employment. Yeah. Um, so Marx in saying, you know, let's go get them. It made the least sense. Um, because the landowners, they had just passed down for, you know, generations. So it was different. Whereas Schwab in saying that uh, you own nothing and be happy today is you different because we all own our houses, their cars or whatever. They own nothing back then. Yeah, nothing. Well, so it's a substantial difference. Uh, yeah, before, finally, I keep saying finally, but do you think this Roe v. Wade thing, which is probably going to pop any day, is going to separate the states and bring this whole states' rights thing even more to the forefront, where states are going to say, this is what we're going to do here in Oklahoma, or what we're going to I, do? I, well, I think it just contributes to it. Yeah, going to add um, to it, right? Separation. I don't think it's it's the major uh, issue no. uh, that is going to be by itself uh, the defining moment or something like that. Yeah. But it, it's it's... It just adds to this whole thing, you know, the lockdowns and stuff. I mean, here in Florida, honestly, it was no big deal. Yeah. Um, here in Texas, too. There was not much. I mean, our death rate was no different than it was up north. I mean, it was better, probably. Sure. Um, and, you know, you can tell the tourists when they come down here, I'm walking the beach and I saw somebody with a still with a mask and a shield on. <laughs> I think they've been psychologically damaged. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Do, do you think there's any, because um, all politics is theater, right? P uh, performance art. But do you think there's any um, hope or a light on the horizon of more conservative people get in in, in December and stop some of this stuff? I mean, uh, or is that is that just wishful thinking that something I, would get I better? I think it is wishful thinking. Uh, yeah, probably, yeah. <clears throat> Yeah. What you'll see is that the neocons will <clears throat> be out there and any Republican who would be, you know, against the war in Ukraine, oh, he's a Putin supporter. You know? right. This is what you'll see. They want to keep that going regardless of who's there. Hmm. Uh, so I'm, I'm not very hopeful that if you just replace the Democrats with the Republicans in November, that will end all the war. And, and we're, some things will be reversed, yes. Uh, and, but Maybe I think they'll, yeah. they'll play them like a, like a fiddle uh, just to, get, to keep the war going. Uh, and do you think it would be the same thing in 24 if Trump runs, runs, and, runs and wins as well? Um. <clears throat> 24 is probably a major earthquake politically, mm -hmm. globally. And, and it's more than just the United States. Yeah. Putin, Putin is up for election. Zelensky's up for election. The head of the EU is up for election. Whoa. I mean, you just go around the board. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah. All right. I don't think Putin's going to um, be there for 2024. I think it's health issues and things of that nature. Yeah, we've heard about that. Yeah, his um, health issues. Yeah. So I'm concerned because without Putin there, you get one of these hardliners. Uh, and like I say, just read the, the declassified documents. They're from there, the, right? Uh, Under him. The Clinton Hardcore. administration. They're online. Hard Hardcore. Yes. Yeah. They say, listen, Putin is not hardcore. He Whoa. is more democratic. Hmm. And if you look at one of these other guys, I can tell you they've they've even suggested just nuking Kiev and then saying, "Okay, fine, who's next?" Jeez, that's not good. Boulder Bluff. That's not good. What would happen? So do you do think we uh, then send something because of Kiev, and then they send something to New York? I mean, is there is there any way of telling that Putin really does have? Uh, Serious issues going on health wise? Do we know? You'd see rumors and stories. I don't know. That our computer does not like what's after 2024. Just, I think we're heading into a yeah. into world war after that period. Oh, good. It's going to turn up aggressively next year. But look, the U.S. has been way too arrogant. Uh, hmm. 
mm-hmm. with the world. Yes, yeah. And years. yeah, it's it, it's just it's gone too far. And so I think China and and Russia are basically drawing a line in the sand. Says this, this is enough. Hmm. Um, so next so year is going to be change. Yeah, next year is going to be a mess, right? It's yeah. I mean, look, you got Biden in there as president. Come on, um, <laughs> uh, you know it's it's just a disaster, complete disaster. Yeah, really a mess. Well, Martin Armstrong, thanks for being here. I'm sorry I take so much of your time. My goodness, you overstayed your. I overstayed my welcome with you, but thanks. <laughs> it was it's really fun talking to you. And you go to Armstrong Economics, right? You can. Sign up for different. I do a monthly thing. I don't know what do I pay like twenty bucks or something for extra stuff. I don't even know. What I it think is. it's fifteen. Fifteen bucks, something like that. But I get so- extra stuff, so I like that. And uh, Armstrong Economics. So say hi to Socrates. Uh, let me know who's going to win the twenty uh, Sea Biscuit in the fourth race at Pimlico. Maybe he'll <laughs> make some money here. <laughs> All right, Mr. Armstrong. Thank you, sir. Really appreciate oh, it. Thanks. It's always nice to be with you. Thank Take you, care. Bye bye. Martin Armstrong, Patrick Timpone, OneRadioNetwork.com. He's fun. Huh? What a real deal. Well, uh, we're gonna we're gonna pony up here, and we're gonna talk about um, what are we gonna talk about? We're gonna talk about um, mm, mm, regenerative farming. That'll be a change with a with a family that has a regenerative piggy farm and chickens and pigs in uh, Austin, and they're at the farmer's market. Really nice people. And you're going to learn the difference between just old organic and regenerative farming. And that's going to be coming up in about 20 minutes. They're going to be here. So stay there. I'm going to go down and make myself some orange juice. And uh, please pass on these links to everyone that you care about. Uh, uh, the bit shoot, um, we'll have Martin Armstrong up there this afternoon, Tuesday afternoon, the 7th of June. And you can send folks the links if you think they'd enjoy hearing Martin Armstrong's um, ideas on world politics and money for the last, wow, uh, over an hour and 40 minutes. Great show. So I love you all very much. I will see you in 20 minutes. Let me know if I can help. My name is Patrick Timpone, and may the blessings be, baby. Broadcasting from the beautiful Hill Country in Texas, this is OneRadioNetwork.com.